I have been reluctant to tell him my story because a lot of the youngsters did not experience what I experienced. They didn't go through what I went through. My experience here was to be locked out. In 1954, the landmark Supreme Court case Brown versus Board of Education established that racial segregation of public schools was unconstitutional. The case made a little girl named Linda Brown from Topeka, Kansas, the face of school desegregation. But like many fights of the civil rights era, the story begins far earlier than that. When you think of what happens here in Prince Edward, it's prior to the Montgomery bus boycotts. It's prior to the Selma to Montgomery voting rights marches. And I don't think you can talk about the modern civil rights movement without understanding what happens here in Prince Edward County. The facilities of black schools were generally inferior to white schools at the time. One of those schools was the all-black Robert Russa Moton High School in Prince Edward County, Virginia, where a museum bearing its name now stands. The school was built for 180 students, but by 1951, it was bursting with over 450. Some classes were held in an old school bus, others in tar paper rooms heated with potbelly stoves. The students staged a walkout that year, launching a two-week strike and demanding the school board build a bigger, better school. This student walkout would lead to a local court case, Davis versus County School Board of Prince Edward. And that Davis case would combine with cases from four other communities to make up what we would know as Brown v. Board of Education. The Brown ruling in 1954 was supposed to radically alter education for black children, but white populations across the South almost immediately fought against its implementation. None more so than in Prince Edward County, where that student walkout helped propel the Brown case to the Supreme Court. The county closed at least 20 public schools from 1959 to 1964, denying upwards of 1,500 students in education for five years. Historians regard it as one of the fiercest acts of resistance against school desegregation. So what happened to the students, the black students and the white students? The White Citizens Council within the community created a school, created a school that was a private school that opened up in Prince Edward County just for white children. For the black community, there were no forms of public schooling. My family, who did not have a lot of resources, were a part of that segment of the community that did without formal schooling for that time period. Civil rights groups came into the county and helped to set up makeshift schools uh, that were called training centers. Black women organized grassroots schools in their homes. So imagine being a mom and you have a school-aged child and you send your child away to another family that you don't know just so that your child can get that education. We basically moved into the house with the family. The first family, they didn't have any children. The second family had children, but it was really a big house. They had about four children and five more came in and we still could get lost in the house, so to speak. And it didn't only impact the students. The black teachers in the community lost their jobs as well. I had to spend day and night traveling over this state, following behind complaints of black teachers being dismissed, where schools were being desegregated. They tried to say, we don't want black teachers teaching white students. Teaching at that time was a profession that was heavily lauded. It was a profession highly respected, particularly within the black community. In fact, nationwide, tens of thousands of black teachers lost their jobs as an unanticipated consequence of Brown v. Board of Education. Taken together, the vanishing of black teacher jobs and the school closings dramatically affected lives across the county. One estimate found that illiteracy rates of blacks ages 5 to 22 jumped from 3% to 23% in those five years, even as the push for desegregation continued. 
A pending court case was amended in 1961 to challenge private school tax breaks given to white families. As that case, Griffin v. County School Board of Prince Edward County was making its way to the Supreme Court, the Justice Department stepped in, encouraged by a broader civil rights movement sweeping the South. It spearheaded efforts to create a free schools program in 1963 for all children in the community. And they really are interested in what's happening here in Prince Edward because they understand that if a county cannot fund its public schools and shut them down and get away with it, then Brown would be a dead letter across the South. And a year later, the Supreme Court ruled on the Griffin case, ordering all schools in the county to reopen and declaring the time for mere deliberate speed has run out. When Everett R. Berryman Jr. eventually graduated from Moton High School in 1967, the schools were still mostly black. The whole experience, when I look back on it, helped me to get to where I am today. Actually, it caused me to step up to the plate and to find myself. And once I found myself, then I could go on forward. Today, the public school system is 65% students of color, a hard-earned legacy of the fight to implement the Brown Mandate. But so too are the unmistakable remnants of the racial divide. The private school that was founded in 1959 during the school closures is still there and it remains overwhelmingly white. And though students of color now sit in public school classrooms, more than half of them are economically disadvantaged. One historian attributes the poor adult literacy rates in part to those lost five years, when over a thousand black students were denied an education. Progress, it turns out, is complicated to define. Many of us speak of the Brown era as if it's all over with. It isn't all over with, it's still going on in one form or another. 